Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcikowski. I am a faculty member at Northwestern University and the director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It is really a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx and Latin American communities across the Americas. Today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space. <clears throat> Pablo Minio, PhD, is Assistant Professor of Public Relations at Boston University. Mora Matassi, a doctoral candidate at Northwestern University and an affiliate of the Center for Latinx Digital Media, will introduce Pablo in just a minute. I am delighted to note that this quarter our series is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Center for Global Culture and Communication, the Department of Communication Studies, the Department of Radio, Television and Film, and the Program in Latin American and Caribbean Studies. But before we go to the seminar, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Ottawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Conchank nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and the institution's history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me say briefly a little bit more about how the seminar will unfold. First, Mora will tell us more about Pablo's research and career in just a minute. Then, Pablo will present his work. After that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar. Mora will moderate. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Mora, the screen is all yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Pablo, thank you for having me as moderator for today's edition of the virtual seminar series. It is an honor for me to introduce our guest speaker for today, Professor Pablo Mino. Pablo Mino is Assistant Professor of Public Relations at Boston University. He obtained his PhD in Media and Communication and a Graduate Certificate in Latin American Studies from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he was awarded with the Rachel Davis Mercy Outstanding PhD Student Award. Professor Mino also has an MA in Mass Communication from UNC Chapel Hill and a BA in Journalism from the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. Dr. Mino's research focuses on the intersection of international, intercultural, and strategic communication. From a critical cultural standpoint, his latest work has examined how Latin American governments use branding principles to commodify and promote their national reputation abroad, particularly in the global north. In his scholarship, published in venues like the International Journal of Communication, Public Relations Inquiry, and Public Relations Review, Professor Mino uses concepts and ideas coming from the public relations field, critical branding, Latin American studies, and colonialism literature. In conversation with his research path, Professor Mino in the past worked in government. Between 2013 and 2015, he was communications consultant of Chile's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In today's presentation, Professor Mino will examine the expansion of nation branding in Latin America. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Pablo Mino. Thank you so much for that very generous um, presentation. Can everyone see my screen? Yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, it's truly a pleasure to be here. I'm so delighted and honored to be here presenting um, a little bit about my research and what I've done so far in public relations, critical branding, and Latin American studies, which is pretty much the title of my presentation today, Expanding Theory and Research in Public Relations and Critical Branding, a Focus in Latin America. 
So again, I just want to start off by explaining a little bit about the focus of my research, which again lies at the intersection of critical branding, Latin American studies, and public relations. I look at critical branding because I draw from the critical cultural studies literature to think about why nowadays we brand ideas that in the past were not intended for sale, which in the, in the case of my research applies to the branding of countries. I also look at the Latin American studies literature to draw from colonialism and other fields to inform how different countries within the region have done this nation branding work. And then finally, the public relations literature is from where I got get most of the theoretical framework that informs my research. I do consider myself a PR scholar, and it is where I ground myself in the literature. So with that explanation, I can explain now um, the definition of nation branding. Uh, and the one that I use is from a scholar a critical scholar of nation branding, uh, Dr. Nadia Kaneva at the University of Denver. And she defined nation branding as the compendium of discourses and practices aimed at reconstituting nationhood through marketing and branding paradigms. And I just wanna stop for a second and um, make everyone in the audience hopefully question themselves, these concepts of nationhood, marketing and branding all in the same sentence. So thinking that we can brand a country's identity or identities or cultures and use branding and marketing principles to do that type of work. That's the main motto that drives my research and question that practice from a critical standpoint. A little bit about nation branding in Latin America. This is a work that has been done in the region since the, two, uh, the mid of the 2000s. Uh, it started very early on, on with countries such as Mexico, Colombia, and then other countries followed suit, uh, like Chile, Argentina, Peru, Colum um, Costa Rica, Brazil, etc. The main focus of these uh, projects in the region has been to attract exports, tourism, and foreign direct investments to these countries. So, for example, countries like Mexico, Brazil, Costa Rica, they are known for their tourism industries, and they use nation branding to draw more tourists to go to these countries and then spend their holidays there. So that's more from a consumer, final consumer perspective. But then when we think about investment, you think about uh, global multinational, for example, mining companies uh, that go to these countries and want to invest in the region and want to invest in developing the mining sector, for example, in countries like Peru, or in Chile, right? And then the export angle is this idea that you can brand a product associated with the reputation of a country. So for example, that happens very clearly with Guatemalan coffee or Colombian coffee, or for example, wines from Argentina or from Chile, right? This idea that you can brand a product and associate that branding with the image of a country. So these are examples of nation branding in the region. And these are some of the logos that have uh, justified that work. Um, since then. Before diving into nation branding, I just want to talk a little bit about the theoretical approaches that inform PR and nation branding scholarship, broadly speaking, which there are two, right? So if we think about public relations, uh, scholar Lee Edwards at the London School of Economics, she defined that there are two approaches to practice and study public relations, the functional approach and the sociocultural approach. The functional approach has a business management perspective. It's about how PR can help the organization to get more businesses, or it's thinking about the effectiveness of the campaign or how persuasive a campaign or a piece of public relations work can be among their intended audiences. On the flip side, the sociocultural approach is about questioning those practices and then questioning who has power over others when doing that type of work. It's critical and it's cultural by nature. The approaches that define the study and practice of nation branding, also drawing from the work of scholar Nadia Kanova, um, she identified that there are three, uh, the technical economic, the political, and the cultural approaches. The technical economic is this uh, approach to nation branding that we want to market a country for, again, business reasons, right? So uh, getting more tourists to go and visit a country or getting those exports out there or fostering investment offerings. That's the technical economic approach. And it is an approach that is instrumentalist and functionalist by nature. 
The political approach is very similar to the technical economic approach. The, the difference there is that instead of using nation branding for economic reasons, it's used for political reasons. It's used for governments to enhance their soft power abroad and gain a, gain a better reputation for diplomatic or, again, political reasons. So again, this approach is also instrumental, instrumentalist and functional by nature. And the third approach, uh, the cultural approach, is the one that I use in my research. And is it's not concerned with providing recommendations on how to best execute a nation brand. It's about questioning those practices and questioning who has power over others in the definitions that are going to be um, represented in these brands, in the cultures or identities or the power uh, imbalances that define that type of work. So if we look at this from a, from a perspective of like thinking about potential research questions that could inform this type of work, the first research question here says, what is the effectiveness of a campaign, right? So from a public relations approach, that would be a functional perspective to PR, right? And then from a nation branding approach, that would be a technical, economic, or political approach to nation branding, right? So thinking about how effective are we being, or how functional, or how instrumental is we're being with the work that we're doing right? It's about the effectiveness. It's about getting the people to be interested in your country for political or economic or financial reasons. But if we look at it from another perspective, and then thinking about the second research question posed here, which says, who has the power to decide the culture, cultures and identities that will represent an idea? That's a clear nudge to the public relations approach of a sociocultural approach, right? And then from a nation branding standpoint, that's a nudge to the cultural approach to nation branding. So again, more critical and more cultural by nature. So what I want to do now is that I want to put all of these theory into the research that I've done so far. Uh, and I'm going to present two articles, uh, one that was, that was published last year uh, at the International Journal of Communication, and then the second one that was recently accepted for publication at Communication, Culture, and Critique. Uh, so the first study that I'm presenting here is the study published, published in International Journal of Communication, which conceives nation branding as an expression of modern colonialism in Latin America. So what does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> I just want to pause for a minute there and walk you through um, the reasoning and the theory behind that. So to do this work, to, to write this, uh, this research, I use world systems theory coming from the sociology field. Um, so world, world systems theory proposes that within the world's economy, there are three types of countries. Countries at the core of the world's economy, countries at the semi-periphery, and then countries at the periphery. Core nations are industrialized nations, developed nations, countries that have advanced industries that manufacture products using high level technologies. And then those products that they produce are then later exported to semi-periphery and peripheral nations. On the flip side, peripheral and semi-peripheral nations sustain their economies with the export of commodities and raw materials, which is again, then used by the core nations to produce um, the products that then they manufacture and then to which they give these highly developed technologies um, to then export them again to the core and uh, to the periphery and the semi-periphery, right? So if we put it uh, in the perspective of nation branding, let's remember again that the main goals for nation branding are to promote tourism, to promote exports, and to promote foreign direct investment, right? If we think about the types of materials that within Latin America um, we produce, and I say we because I am Chilean and I'm Latin American. Um, we think about, for example, uh, copper from Chile or bananas from uh, Central America or coffee, right? We think about the raw materials, the commodities that we export to countries like China or countries like the United States or Western European nations, which are examples of core nations, developed nations, right? So there's already this power imbalance if we want to look at it from that perspective about the world's economy and then the role that each country has in that economy, global economy. So the, the context of this research was focused on three case studies, the case studies of Chile, Colombia, and Peru. 
Chile, Colombia, and Peru have launched nation brands to economically develop their countries and promote their exports, tourism, and FDI opportunities abroad. They started uh, countries like Chile and Colombia. They started in 2004, 2005, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But then Peru uh, started this work in 2011 uh, with a lot of um, emphasis on tourism, on, on exports, and investment. The people behind these initiatives have been governments and multinational branding and advertising agencies that have executed this work, right? And the advice that these governments have been given by these agencies has been to create a nation brand that's the same way that you create a brand for a product, right? So work on the product's identity or the brand's identity. So I just want to pause for a minute here and uh, maybe make you question yourself, when you think about Nike, what's the identity of Nike as a brand that produces um, materials that we use in sports, right, for example, or uh, shoes or sports gear, broadly speaking, you think about a brand that produces those materials, those products, but at the same time, there's this identity around the brand or the same with Apple, with Mac products, or the same with maybe Amazon or McDonald's, right? These are all brands, multinational brands that work on their product's identity or brand's identity. And then they use that identity to brand the product or service or whatever it is that they're selling, right? So working on the brand identity to inform the brand image. That same insight has been applied to the branding of countries. So the advice that has been given to these nations has been, let's work on what's your brand's identity or what's your nation's identity. And let's use that as a competitive advantage to then inform your nation branding work, right? Use the identity to do the brand management for your country. So with that background, I, uh, I wanted to study what are the perceptions of the people behind these campaigns, right? And I conducted interviews, in-depth interviews with 21 professionals involved in nation branding initiatives for these three countries uh, between the 2000s and late 2010s. Um, and the three research questions that I propose in that study are, what are the conceptions of modernity and development and specifically economic development that professionals behind these nation branding efforts used to drive their work? What's the justification for them to even engage with this practice in the first place? That was the first research question. The second research question is, what are the conceptions of Chilean, Colombian, and Peruvian identities that nation branding professionals use to manage and improve a country's brand? Again, what's their conception of national identity or national identities? How have they gotten in the first place to that insight? That's the, that's the second research question. And then in the third research question, in the context of the coloniality of power, which is a concept that I'm going to go back to in the discussion later on, how do nation branding campaigns account for the contested notions of what entails a country's culture and identity that is represented through each brand? This third research question is more about the power dynamics that exist within a country, or maybe if there's some pushback between people that maybe do not agree with the message that th that's been put forward by these governments and these multinational branding agencies to then brand a country, right? So those are the three research questions that inform this, this, this research, this article. A little bit of context on these campaigns before diving into the results. I just want to tell you um, about how these projects came to exist in the first place. So here to the left, we see the logos for Chile. So in 2005, Chile launched this campaign, Chile Always Surprising. And then in 2013, they launched uh, this new uh, logo without, uh, without a slogan this time, but that maintained the stars that are very characteristic of the clear skies that you can see in Chile, according to the people behind these, um, these campaigns, right? So the focus of these campaigns for Chile were strictly economic. They were trying to promote exports, investment, and tourism. That was a very clear focus from early on. And the focus was always international. It was always abroad. It was always, let's go and let's promote the image of country because we want to develop economically our country through exports, through investment, and then through tourism. It always had an external focus. On the flip side, uh, and then here to the right, we see the example of Colombia. So in, Colom uh, uh, in Colombia, there were two big nation branding projects that have existed throughout their history. 
So the first one was launched in 2004. And it's this insight that Colombia is passion. It had a very strong tourism focus at the beginning. And the idea of passion, again, it was also very similarly to Chile. It had an external focus, but then for some reason, the idea of passion among Colombians and um, internally within the nation is something that really resonated with them. And it's something that I'm going to explain later in the results, but just uh, explain that um, in the meantime. And then in 2010, with a new government that came to Colombia, uh, there's this new uh, branding um, effort called Colombia Co, which is only a logo, uh, very colorful logo, but that did not have the same level of attachment among Colombians, right? It was also, the focus of this project was also external. It was also thinking about tourism. It was also thinking about exports. It was also thinking about investment. Actually, uh, the inside of Colombia is passion, is something that people said that did not really resonate with the promotion of um, investment and exports, which are more serious oriented um, industries. And something very similar happened with Chile always surprising. So this idea of always surprising is something that maybe for tourism was very attractive, but then for more serious industries, such as exports or investment, it wasn't really that good to promote, right? So we have here the examples of Chile and Colombia. And then finally, the example uh, of Peru, uh, this is a brand that was launched in 2011. Again, again, same idea. Uh, the focus was always external. It was always on getting more people to go to Peru as a tourist or getting people to invest in the country or buy products from Peru. But something that they did differently is that they presented the brand internally to Peruvians. So in 2011, they did events to uh, basically explain what the nation branding strategy of the country was and then why that was important in the context through which Peru was going through as a country in the early 2010s, which was a period of um, highly uh, economic development, high economic development for the nation, um, which is something that, again, I'm going to touch on in the findings section. So there are three main findings here to this study. The first one is that nation branding uh, within uh, these three countries was informed by conceptions of development and modernity in Latin America, right? So the people behind these campaigns for three for the three countries, they strongly agreed that nation branding was something that they were doing because they needed to promote exports, investment, and tourism offerings in these countries. It's something that was important for them to do economically for the economic development of their country, right? That's something that they all agreed on very early on. Something that was also interesting was to think about the target markets for their work, right? So all of them mentioned countries like the United States, the UK, France, Germany, China, which are again examples of core nations, developed nations of the world, and how these three countries from their peripheral standpoint were trying to get the attention of publics in these three countries, in, the, in all of these countries, these core nations. And then this economic develop, uh, economic dependency at each national level. So each country economically depends on countries such as the US, uh, the UK, France, Germany, China, et cetera. These economic dependency put each of these countries in direct competition with one another at the regional level as well. So. Chile, Colombia, Peru are examples of countries that were all competing from the same set of resources coming from core nations of the world. Again, publics in the US, publics in the UK, Western Europe, China, uh, Japan, etc. That's the first finding, that their understanding of economic development uh, justified their nation branding work. This first finding informs the second one, which is this idea that national identity is a strategic asset for nation branding management, right? So again, this idea that we need to work on a brand identity, or a which again lies at the, at the conception of national identity, was used to work on the brand image or the nation branding work of the brand, right? All of them agreed that it was important to agree on a national identity and let's use that from an instrumentalist or functional perspective. Again, going all the way back to the technical economic approach coined by uh, Nadia Kaneva, right? Some of these countries presented their nation brand internally to secure that buy-in, right? To make sure that there was a cohesive message coming internally from these countries and then also externally, right? Some of these countries did, did this better than others 
Peru has been mentioned as the example in the region of good nation branding work. And it's precisely because Peruvians have been uh, examples of, uh, of a country that has really adopted their nation brand. It's something that they're very proud of, but it's something that they're proud of, not necessarily because of the brand, but because of what the brand represents, which is something that I'm going to talk about in the third finding. This council, this idea that you need to work on your brand identity, came from these multinational advertising agencies that work with countries uh, in the region. So agencies such as BBDO or Gray or Future Brand provided the same type of uh, logic uh, for when, when, when branding a private label. So again, this idea that the way you brand Nike or the way that you brand McDonald's or Amazon or eBay, these private labels, you work on their identity as a private label. That same insight was used to brand countries, right? And then their, their advice was also to secure that buy-in internally, right? So to make sure that there's a cohesion between internal and external communications from coming from these countries, right? But only an appeal to national identity does not secure that buy-in, which leads me to the third insight. Uh, the third finding, which is that nation branding is really a reflection of a country's moment in history, right? So national identity was used to instill feelings of pride. That's something that happened very clearly in Peru's case. Uh, Peruvians, informants from Peru, were very clear that the nation brand represented something that they were proud of, which at the moment was that readoption or revalue on the things that made them Peruvians, right? So for example, their gastronomy, their cuisine, that it's um, uh, internationally known, their heritage as the Inca empire, uh, all of those things that they saw that people internationally were valuing as Peruvianness is something that was represented in the brand. So in a way, the brand only represented that feeling but it's not necessarily a product of the advice that came to secure that buy-in, to work on that internal buy-in among the people of the country, because that's the right thing to do to brand a country, to brand a product, right? It's really a representation. The brand is really a representation of the specific moment in the history of Peru, right? Which tells us that nation brands are products of the economic, social, and political periods in the history of a country, right? Which, com which is something that is completely disregarded from the technical e economic approach or the political approaches to nation branding. That's actually what makes the cultural approach to nation branding much stronger because, again, these other two approaches with this functionalist view of branding, they propose that this is something that you can manage and that you can control, when in reality, it is outside of the hands of the brand managers behind the, the work. It's more about the political, the social, the cultural context through which the country is going through at the moment in our history that really defines the success of a nation brand, right? Nation brands can only put a logo to that feeling, which uh, could make people within a country to better embrace that brand, right? So this leads me to propose nation branding as an expression of modern colonialism, right? This study conceptualizes nation branding as a venue for developing nations to know and learn the capitalism discourse of the Western world in the late stages of the 20th century. Nation branding is beco then becomes their own expression of modernity or economic development. Another piece of evidence to think about the duality between modernity and coloniality. <clears throat> right? So I want to pause for a minute here and then <clears throat> explain what's this idea of the duality between modernity and coloniality, or what is the coloniality of power, right? So the coloniality of power is a concept proposed by Peruvian sociologist Aníbal Quijano, uh, and then the work of Walter Mignolo, uh, an Argentinian cultural studies um, scholar. Um, they propose that um, the even though countries within the region have shied away from the colonial past, colonialism is something that is still very pervasive until this very day within the Latin American uh, spectrum, right? So the heritage of colonialism, it's something that is very much alive, right? And if you look at the, the, the matrix here, the, the figure here, there are four edges of this uh, colonial matrix of power, which is an, a reinterpretation of Quijano's coloniality of power work. There are four um, different edges, right? One is racism, gender, and sexuality. The other is authority. The other is economy. And then the fourth one is knowledge and subjectivity, right? So I want to pause for a minute in the 
economy and knowledge and subjectivity edges of this matrix, right? It's very clear that nation branding within the region has been justified for that economic dependency, that economic development need to, again, grow these countries, right? We need to sustain these countries' economies, and that's why we're doing nation branding in the first place. It's something that we saw that other countries were doing. Branding is the language of neoliberalism, and we want to engage with that in the same way that people can brand a product, right? We can also brand a country, right? Because we want to bring in more dollars. We want to bring in more capital to our, to our nations, right? So if you think about it from the knowledge and subjectivity perspective of the matrix, that branding becomes a really clear example of the knowledge piece, which is again, heritage of colonialism, right? Which in most of Latin America was Spain um, with some exceptions, of course, from some, for some Latin American countries. But then nowadays, the countries from on which uh, countries within Latin America depend economically are the United States and the UK, right? If or China these days as well. And the language and the way that you talk about economic development is through the language of branding, right? So again, that's why this study conceptualizes nation branding as a venue for developing nations to know and learn the capitalism discourse of the Western world. Branding is the tool that we need to develop our, con our countries, right? So beyond just thinking about nation branding as an economic development strategy, we're also using the same repertoires coming from the Western world, from the global north on how are you supposed to do this type of work in the first place, which is really exciting about this type of, of work. So the second study that I, that I want to show, uh, it's a study that was just recently accepted for publication in Communication, Culture, and Critique. And it's about what those representations about Latin American countries uh, and Latin American cultures and identities represent, right? So Nestor Garcia Canclini, uh, another uh, critical cultural studies scholar from Latin America, he described Latin American media and communication industries as vehicles for cultural expression, equalizing national identities to reduce market-oriented discourses about the nation in a context of globalization, right? So the, the media and communication industries within Latin America, they want to represent, some of them, they want to represent a, a version of their countries for global consumption, for the for, for grabbing the attention of others, right? And as my research suggests, the same situation applies to left Latin American nation branding. So what did I do to study this for, uh, further? I wanted to know what the actual advertisements said about these countries, right? And then going all the way to all these countries doing nation branding work in the region, right? So I conducted a qualitative content analysis of 72 video advertisements of 18 Latin American countries published to YouTube between 2010 and 2020, which was a high period for nation branding in the region. These videos had to be in English, had to explicitly promote a country's exports, tourism, or investment offerings to foreign audiences, and had to come from a trusted source, an official government or official nation branding organization account, right? Uh, again, this study uh, was qualitative by nature, and I use close reading techniques, which are uh, which is the, the the discipline of mindful discipline reading of an of an object with a view to deeper uh, to get a deeper understanding of its meanings, right? So there are two main themes that emerge from this analysis, right? And this is the first one. The first one was this idea that um, uh, in some of these ads there was this adventurous foreigner who went to Latin America pretty much by themselves to know what was in this unknown land to them, right? So here are three examples, one's from Costa Rica, the second one's from Chile, and then the third one's from Honduras, right? So even though there are different countries, different uh, political or social contexts, all of them use pretty much the same set of techniques, right? So having a a leading um, person, a leading man or woman going on their own and venturing to know what was out there. So for example, if we look at the example of the of the first um, uh, example from Costa Rica, there's this woman and she, uh, with a perfect English accent, she pre presents herself in the ad as a neuroscientist 
that and she goes to Costa Rica because she wants to know what is so special about this place. And I'm just going to read here. What is it about a beautiful sunrise that energizes the body? That perfect cup of coffee that makes you feel strong and warm inside? Or the sound of crashing water that reconnects you to the wonderment of nature, right? So nature, coffee, these are all types of industries that Costa Rica promotes heavily abroad. So Colum uh, Costa Rican coffee or tourism in Costa Rica. These are different, uh, not just to specific portions of nation branding. And through her gaze, as an outsider of the country, we get to learn and experience Costa Rica as well as the viewer, right? The same happens with Chile, right? So in Chile, this blonde white man uh, joined by what we could assume is his partner, uh, go to Chile and they and they experience the desert in Chile, they experience Patagonia, they interact with the locals, but through their gaze, through their perspective, right? And he says in the video, Chile isn't an easy place to define. It's hard to explain with words, maybe because there are just not enough. Chile has to be seen, felt, and heard. Right. And that invitation done to the viewer is done through his perspective as an outsider of Chile. And then the same happened uh, with Honduras. Right. So this tourist, uh, he went to Honduras and he uh, did uh, um, the, um, the zip line. He got on the zip line. He went uh, snorkeling. He went and uh, tried the fish, uh, the local fish produced by the local people. And having all of these experiences to know what is it that it's so special about Honduras from the tourist perspective, right? So that's the first thing. And then the second theme is about the people from these countries and their depictions on these ads, right? So here's this idea that the locals proudly serve the foreigner who comes to visit these nations, right? So for example, in, 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 the, same, in the same category, Peru, in the first row, um, they are making a reference to mother nature, right? So they are making a reference to all the good things that are produced in, uh, in Peru's geography, right? So Peru, obviously, they have the Andes Mountains. They have a very strong um, heritage, a very strong um, indigenous culture, and they're seen in the app. They're seen producing the potatoes, the mangoes, the avocados that are later used for global consumption. And then here you, you, you see this tourist trying uh, Peruvian pisco, for example. And then when it's uh, in the copy of the ad, it says she is thousands, even millions of years old, and yet she is more alive than ever. She nurtures them, protects them, and above all, she feeds them. So when they're talking about she, they're talking about mother nature. They're talking about how their land is so rich with things to produce and then export internationally. And then how the people in Peru are proud of that heritage and then they're producing those things to then export and share with others from other countries right from a different perspective the example of el salvador um, this is an ad that promoted the investment in the tourism industry in the in the country so most of these resorts that exist in central america they're actually owned by foreign um owned companies that go to these countries in the Caribbean and then invest in building a, a all-inclusive resort, right? So when making that invitation from the perspective of El Salvador and why is it a good place to go and invest in the tourism industry, they say, here in our land, you will find incredible hosts, people who are both born tenacious, generous, and proud of their country and their work. They look towards the future with only one goal, growing with you. And that's the example of El Salvador making the invitation for foreign investors to go and again invest in El Salvador and particularly their tourism industry. And then finally, the example of Nicaragua, uh, they were uh, portrayed as this country in Central America that were highly connected uh, because of their geographical position to markets in the US, to markets in Central America, and also in South America, right? And then how within Nicaragua, there's human talent that is considered young, dynamic, and highly qualified, making Nicaragua one of the most competitive investment platforms in the Americas. 
So the main uh, result of this article is that nation branding in the region is used as a self-stereotyping strategy, right? So all campaigns presented in the study presented the interaction between the foreigner and the local as separate and discrete entities. So not much interaction between them. You either saw or experienced the country through, through the gaze of the foreigner or the local. And for the cases in which Latin America was not presented in an exotic way, it was depicted as a safe, strategic, and smart destination for foreign direct investment and global businesses, right? So you're either using the insight of Latin America as an exotic land, which plays very well with tourism, but you're also, if you want to switch gears and go more on the safe route, you place these countries as safe, strategic, and smart destinations for foreign direct investment. We're going to treat you well here. It's going to be safe for you to come and invest um, in our countries. These ads place the locals as foreign others, taking the gaze and perspective of the adventurous foreigner as normal. The adventurous foreigner was prioritized in these ads, and then the locals depicted were in service to them. That leads me to wrap up my presentation, um, thinking about public relations from a sociocultural perspective, which is what fuels my research. The sociocultural approach to public relations calls researchers to examine power imbalances that affect a subject under study, and then applied to Latin American nation branding as a case study. This is examined when we question why countries engage in self-stereotyping strategies to lure audiences in the global north. So with that, um, I'll just open for questions or any comments that you may have. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Pablo. This was absolutely wonderful. I am so fascinated by your research topic. Um, it, don't, it not only interests me in a theoretical way, but also in a pragmatical way and in a personal political way, because I'm from Argentina and I've always you know, looked at these uh, representations of my own country in foreign countries and how we know that creates a sort of strange feeling when one's a local seeing how one's country is being represented abroad. Um, so I want to first start by reminding the audience that we have a Q&A bottom in the chat. Um, so you can leave your questions there and I will read them for you. So I will start with two questions. I have many questions for you, but I will start with two. I break them, them down. Uh, so my first question would be, uh, you showed us a super complex comparative work um, in one region, which is the Latin American region, about how uh, branding occurs, who creates this branding, and the political and social cultural dynamics that impact this branding. Now, my question would be, what would happen if we compared this region to, for instance, another region from the global north? Because when you were presenting, I couldn't avoid to think about um, France, the case of France, and Paris in particular, uh, which strikes me as one of the most branded nations ever. Um, you know, they, they have crafted this identity of uh, the Frenchness, and how and they have actually shaped many spaces that they you know um, take care of as for instance the Alliance Française you know these places where people go to study French in different parts of the world and in all of their cultural institutions they really work to you know convey this idea of what the Frenchness could be and what's you know having fun in France and what's good eating in France and you know people with the with the French hat etc so they have really crafted their own self branding. So I wonder how how could you compare both types of branding? Are they also impacted by some sort of you know inverted colonialism? Are they also impacted by foreigners' ideas of what their own culture is? That would be my first question. And then I have many more others, but let's just start with that one. Thank you so much. And should I stop sharing my screen or can yes, I just please, please, thank you. Yes. So I that's a fascinating question and. I also have many thoughts about it. So the first one is that nation branding has also been studied in other regions of the world, uh, particularly Eastern Europe, right? So Eastern European countries um, have also engaged in nation branding and actually uh, the work of Nadia Kaneva and the work of other scholars in that region also examines that Eastern Europe specifically. And there are a lot of very similar things that happen in Eastern Europe with Latin America. 
Um, so I just wanted to start by saying that it is there is some work being done um, in other geographies. Although we also need to keep in mind that the we cannot really compare Eastern Europe with Western Europe because I would say that the realities between the two regions are fairly different. Obviously, Eastern Europe was under the um, influence, the Soviet influence until 1990. So their realities are vastly different from those in countries in Western Europe. So I just wanted to start off by saying that. And then thinking about the case of France, I honestly don't have like a super insightful answer to that. I wish I would. But the only thing that I would say is that countries in the global north that are powerful, like again, we can think of France, we could think of Germany, we can think of the UK, we could think of the US, we could even think about China these days, right? These are countries that are, are highly featured, not only on commercial media, but also in the news, right? They're much more newsworthy. Um, and there's a reason, there, there, there are also obviously social and political reasons why that happens, right? So, but with that being said, they have much more of a platform to show different representations of the nation, right? So I think that one thing that Eastern Europe and Latin America have in common is that they're not highly prominent regions of the world in other sources of media. Again, like thinking about the news, right? They're not as prominent, which triggers them to then invest in nation branding as a strategy because they see people either do not know us or they have a bad rep uh, a bad perception about us. So we need to engage in branding because we wanna shy away from those perceptions, which is something that does not really happen with France or the US or Germany, et cetera, right? They have much more of a platform. And I do think that these countries, because of that platform, there's room for other people to have or to show different versions of their country, right? Which is something that is different from what happened in the case of Latin America, for example, on, on which most of the governments with these multinational agencies were deciding what's going to be the strategy or what is it that we want to show out there, right? So it's much more intentional about them coming forward and saying, this is what we want to show because this is what this is what's going to sell. This is, one of, is what's going to get people's attention, which maybe France or other countries, they have much more of an opportunity for people within those countries to use that prominence or that newsworthiness to show different versions of the nation. Um, but again, obviously there are stereotypes associated with all of them as well. And like France is a really good example. And I don't know, I honestly don't know, I don't have the answer that until what extent they really make use of that stereotype in a good way or, or bad way, or if they even enjoy that or not, maybe they don't. So I really don't know, but I do think that they have much more of a platform. Yes, absolutely. Uh, they do have much more of a platform. The newsworthiness, I think it plays an important role. And I was just thinking, and I'm going to just say this and leave other people to ask questions, but uh, I was just thinking these days, you know, that France is going uh, through a very um, difficult political moment, at least in Paris, with the strikes. Uh, and I've seen many posts on TikTok and Twitter and other social media platforms for people who are living in Paris, perhaps for like foreign students, et cetera, they make fun of the contrast between the idea that they have of you know Frenchness, this touristic imagination of France versus the political strikes and the political conflictive uh, nature of, of France as a country. So that, that's a, an interesting contrast right there. But I'm gonna leave Facundo because I know that he has one question to ask. Uh, thank you very much, Pablo. This was truly, truly uh, insightful presentation. Uh, I learned a lot, and also uh, agree with Mora's comments on like being part, being represented in many of the things you were presenting. Um, my my question is about um, the resistance of these national identity or national branding projects, and how. Um, Especially by local communities, um, in many of the depictions you were showing in the advert in the ad advertising uh, that you were showing, uh, many like local communities, indigenous communities were portraying those depictions. So I, I was wondering how these uh, these advertisements and how like these images were received. If you have any insight from your interviews and and the analysis you conducted. Uh, and if so, how this was incorporated or absorbed, I don't know, I want to hear your thoughts on that, uh, how this was made of the, how, how this was incorporated in the, in the products that these uh, 
projects were uh, showing. Um, yeah, that, that's that's my first question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. That's a great question. Uh, so with these three case studies, so all of them follow the technical economic approach to nation branding. So it was pretty much them uh, coming up with the insight or the brand's identity or under their understanding of what's the national identity that we want to represent, thinking what's going to sell more, right? Um, so I would say that, and like, for example, Peru, they they did say that they showed the branding efforts to like Peruvians, like internally. And that's something that was really, that was really appreciated. And in, in their understanding, it was something that it was, again, like that was the right move. Like we needed that to secure the buy-in and it actually worked on our benefit because people within Peru, they produce their brand on their own. Like they're so proud of it. But what I'm proposing with this research is that even though like, and maybe this is going to sound, um, I don't know, but I do think that there was, there was a lot of luck in that. There was a lot of luck and it's not necessarily because the branding management principles were accomplished or checked. It was more about what the brand represented in the moment in history. Um, so even though they do think that it was the right move to show to other people, like this is the branding and this is what we're going to do, the brand really represented that feeling, like that national feeling in the moment in which it was launched. So I would say that for these three case studies. However, <clears throat> for another project that I'm working on right now, there are um, intentional efforts of other countries to create more of that dialogue between different people or different groups of society about what entails our country. And actually Chile um, did that for a little bit. Um, they didn't use that very much in their external efforts, but they did that. But now uh, the new government in Argentina, I talked to the people doing nation branding uh, for Argentina, and they were saying uh, that the value that dialogue and created like co-creation workshops with people from different uh, regions of the country was something that was that they saw as a good thing to do because they needed the input, etc. And I do think that that, like from a normative standpoint, that's the right way to go. But at the same time, I do want, I would like to say that they should also acknowledge that the people are going to engage in that type of exercise very much influenced by their perceptions of what's the current government that's doing that type of work. So that's also something that should be acknowledged. And I'm not sure until what extent people doing nation branding in Argentina, but also in other countries that are trying to go that path, which it seems more democratic, if that makes any sense, um, should be aware of. Like there, even though you're trying to get out there and do that type of thing, that type of work, it like the power power imbalances and the perceptions around this is the country that's putting forward this narrative should be acknowledged. Thank you, Pablo. And actually, uh, we have a question, very interesting question from the audience. You've partly answered it, I think, but I want to ask it either way. Manuel Angel Santillan Vázquez asks, well, he says, thank you very much for the presentation. Very interesting. If the management of the country brand follows a colonialist model and represents the identity of a territory in a stereotyped way, what are the ways are there to show the attributes to contribute to the development of the regions? This is a great question. Thank you so much for asking it because it touches on something that I actually wanted to say. And that is that even though it's very easy to criticize from the outside this work and to engage with it from a theoretical or scholarly perspective, like I was in their shoes like one day and I was doing this type of work. And I know that people who do this type of work actually mean well. They mean well and they want to do it because they can they consider this to be an economic development strategy for their country. So I don't think that they are intentionally following into like the self stereotyping or I mean, maybe they are, but also to some extent. And that's why we need to understand that there's an architecture that facilitates this. It's not only because of their intentions. It's because that's the way the system has been played out for them. And that's the way that they know how to do this. So I just, I always start off by saying, I don't think people mean badly or that they don't have like the best intentions. I think actually that they do. And all the people that I've talked to have been very generous with their time and just trying to make sense of this work from a more theoretical standpoint. I do think that Going, for example, to the examples of the advertisements, 
I think that advertising and branding as disciplines are uh, limited on the road. And I do think that is something that we should also acknowledge uh, when we do this type of work in nation branding. So just understanding the limitations of advertisement, of advertising as, plat as a platform to promote a message. Usually advertising has a very str um, straightforward idea in mind. You wanna grab people's attention. And most of the times there are advertising advertisements that are tone deaf and that really fall short because they just use the stereotype or they go the easy route and go that way, right? So I would say that's one thing that we should all be aware of, the limitations of branding and advertising when, when representing something that can be so contested about countries' identities or cultures, right? So that's the first thing. And I would say also that in addition to that, in addition to branding, in addition to advertising, there are other ways to talk about this type of work and that would not fall under the limitations of branding and advertising necessarily but then using other types of media other types of format to really go in depth and really try to explain and really make sense of the differences between um, the cultures or the identities that define a nation and really try to use those forms of media to supplement this type of work obviously if you're doing advertising and branding try to shy away from the self-stereotyping, understanding that there are limitations of branding and advertising as the medium that facilitates that type of conversation. But at the same time, just be mindful that there are other ways to put the message out there and also to bring in people. Always understanding and acknowledging the limitation of this work. So I do think that people have good intentions, but at the same time, we just need to be more mindful about the limitations. And that's really what my research is trying to put forward, is to show you these are the limitations. I'm not making any normative assumptions of like, this is the way to go, or this is not really the way to go. My role as a researcher has always been, I'm just putting all, all the facts for you, and I'm trying to interpret them for you. But at the same time, I'm not really making a judgment like this is totally bad or this is not something that you should do just know the limitations and know the rules of the game that you're playing that's super fascinating the way that you explain it just now um i think we have time for one more question uh, i know that catalina farias wanted to ask one so i'm gonna stop my camera now. Thank you so much, Pablo, for this presentation. I truly, truly enjoy it. I'm curious about how Na Nation Brownlee works when a, a country is facing like deep social problems or social conflicts or is in crisis. I'm thinking about Chile and the uh, social outbreak that we faced in 2018, 2000, and we're currently facing uh, till today. So how Brownlee is like adapting to this conflict? Yes, yes. Oof, that's a huge question. And, and I mean, it's obviously always easier to work with a clean slate, I would say. And I think for many years, Chile took advantage of that because they were seen as like the tiger in the region or they were the country that was doing things right. But then in 2019, whoops, like this happened and all these issues came to life and came to be known. It's not that they didn't exist before, but came to be more known. And also internationally, people knew about that. So I honestly uh, don't have like a great answer to that. I think that many countries within the region are experiencing these. Uh, for another project, I've been talking to people in countries, like again, in Colombia, something very similar happened in 2021 uh, uh, with uh, protests against the president and also in Paraguay, I talked to them as well. And like, basically it was hard for them to do nation branding work when they were portraying a reality or a narrative about a country. Like for example, come here, invest here, do tourism here, et cetera. When in reality, people were seeing in the news all the things that were happening. So that created a lot of dissonance among them and it was like well we honestly don't know what to do and i i honestly don't have an answer to that i what i've seen and again it's not something that like i have much experience with but is that some countries have been much more niche about the specific things that they promote so maybe not necessarily talking about the country in broad terms but for example if there's specific industry and there's specific publics outside of the country that they want to reach out to then talk about that more 
in, in a micro scale, instead of just doing nation branding as a country as a whole, because that can become problematic when in reality you're showing something or you're putting forward something out there that really does not make much sense to the people outside looking at it. Thank you, Pablo, for a uh, great seminar. Facundo, would you mind um, letting me uh, start my video? Now you should be able to vote. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Pablo, for a great seminar. Thank you for terrific questions as well uh, from the audience and from our team. Um, uh, and thank you, Mora, for, as always, fabulous moderation. Um, I uh, want to invite everybody to join us for next uh, week's uh, seminar of our series. And once again, Pablo, very, very important work and excellently executed. Thank you so much. Thank you yeah. to everyone as well. That's it. And have a great rest of your days. Bye now. Bye.